All right, so uh, I'm going to start with a bit of inspiration from natural intelligence. Let's watch this video for a little bit and see what's happening. Um, let's see if you notice something unusual about the walking pattern of this gentleman. So probably by now you have noticed that um, he pays a lot of attention to his limbs. He's constantly looking at his limbs as he's walking. So what's going on here? So the name of the gentleman is Ian Waterman. So he has a rare infectious disease that causes neurological damage. And he is, from neck down, loses the sense of touch and prior perception. Um, and somewhat surprisingly, um, the people that have this disease, they almost completely lose the ability to move, to walk, even though there is no muscle damage. Everything else works, except for having a sense of um, touch and prior perception. So why is that? So it's actually very interesting. Um, whenever we act, whenever we do something, we heavily rely on these feedbacks that we receive from the environment. For example, whenever you want to grab a glass, um, how do you know how much force you should apply? If you apply too much force, the glass breaks. If you apply too little, the glass is going to slip. How do you know? Um, so the way you solve this problem is that you actually sense the deformation of your fingers and tissues around, around the glass, and that's the type of feedback that you receive, and you solve basically a closed-loop problem. You apply by the time that your sense of touch says that there's enough, and that's the way it works. And that happens also for walking. Um, as I'm walking on this stage, I'm feeling the deformation of my toes and tissues on the ground and my shoe, and that's the way I know actually my feet are in the right place. Now, that's why when you lose this sense of touch, nothing works. And almost no one recovers from this disease. He has been uh, one or two, there has been one or two cases that are reported actually recovering, regaining their capacity to move. And that makes it interesting. Why? Um, how did he do that? So that's the interest of the, uh, the interesting point of the video. He's constantly looking at his limbs. So he basically substituted the haptic feedback that he was receiving with visual feedback. So there are two lessons, basically, in this um, story. The first one that I described is feedback, the importance of solving this problem in a closed-loop manner. That's an interesting topic, but for another day. And the one that is relevant today is multimodality, the substitution of one sensing modality with another. So now, why is this even possible? So it's relatively straightforward, right? The senses that we have, for example, vision and touch, they're all sensing one underlying physical reality. And therefore, between the, these two signals that we receive, there is redundancy. Therefore, it's possible to substitute one for the other. Like I said, it's easier said than done. Um, not many people manage to do it, but he's a living example that actually managed to do it. So it's in theory, it's possible. Now, in fact, um, the role of multimodality has been studied um, quite a bit in psychology, especially in developmental psychology. psychology. There's this known paper uh, by Smith and Gasser that they, uh, they are developmental psychologists. They observe babies, and they basically say that um, they, they list a uh, set, of, um, uh, set of statements, six statements, six lessons, um, that would be useful for developing artificial intelligence based on natural intelligence. And, um, and the number one lesson is that on role of multimodality. So they basically say that multiple overlapping and time lock sensory systems enable, the developing, enable developing systems to educate itself without defining external tasks or teachers just by perceiving and acting in the world. So this statement says more than what we have been discussing. It doesn't say that all oh, two senses have redundancy, so one of them, when one of them stops working, you can substitute with the other one. It basically says that the redundancy between these senses is a way to actually extract supervision and use it to learn how to encode one, one signal um, in a useful way. So essentially, this link that is here, why it is, again, useful, how we can um, how we can instantiate it, like I said, both of these senses are rooted in the same physical reality. And so therefore, by being able to predict what, you're, what you would be feeling if you touch something by looking at it, that would be a useful way of learning how to represent visual information and vice versa. And that's basically the idea of cross-model learning. So what I'll show today is some groundwork, basic infrastructure and architecture work that we have been doing, and uh, hopefully towards addressing this. Um, Problem. So to make it a little bit more grounded, what, uh, what I mean the rest of the talk by modality, I would go this way. So let's say this is our apple that we have been looking at. It's in the world. So we can take a picture of it. This would be one modality. Uh, we can have a depth sensor. This would be another modality, another 3D sensor, like 3D surface normals. 
Um, somebody can give us uh, the bounding box, put a bounding box around where the apple is, um, segmentation of it. Um, somebody can describe it in text. Um, and for example, neural network feature maps are also a legitimate um, a, a modality. We can apply clip network on top of images and view it as a modality that encodes useful information, and so on and so forth. So now, the problem that we want to solve is we want to get all of these modalities, many of them, and have a model that can map any of these modalities to, to any other set of them. And when I say any, it could be every single one of these on the left or any combination of them, any two of them, any three of them, or even more complex cases. Half of the image is coming from one modality, the other half is coming from another modality, and so on. So that's the problem that you're generally trying to solve from an input-output perspective. So basically, we want to have a model that can map anything to anything in terms of these modalities. So how are we going to do this? Um, the basic ideas of let's grab a data set that has all of these modalities, train a gigantic neural network on it is not likely to be very effective. First of all, you would have to have a data set that has all of the modalities. It would have to be large, because sample complexity is not likely to be um, uh, low. And also, probably endemic problems in multitask learning, for example, consistency and so on is going to hit. So we are going to base a few ideas um, on self-supervised learning and so on to make it happen. So the first idea is mass modeling. So if you're not familiar with it, the idea is very straightforward. Let's say you have an RGB image. Uh, you randomly drop some of the observations in the image, some of the patches, and train a big transformer to predict what was missing. And it works. What you're seeing on the, on the right, the first column is the sparse input that the network receives. The middle column is what it reconstructed, and the right column is what the ground truth was. So I can see that the middle column and the right column are pretty similar to each other, which means this prediction did work. And this is a good way of learning a presentation because in order to be able to make these predictions, you would have to have to learn the regularity of the world. The dogs have two eyes, and there are like things that look like dogs. And so this is developing a sense of visual regularity in the world and emergence of objects and so on. You can argue that this would be a useful. And indeed, people use this as a base and do transfer learning on top of it, and it does work. So mass modeling has been recently shown again um, that it is effective um, in 2021. And the first idea that we can do is that we can extend the same idea now, this time, to cross-model learning. So the first, um, you can have, an, let's say, you have three modalities here, um, RGB image. You can do the same thing, grab an RGB image, drop some patches, predict their many ones. But you can train within the same framework um, to do the same problem, but this time with depth. Depth, drop some of it, predict the rest. Same for segmentation. But also, you can extend it and go cross-model this time. So Grab an RGB image, drop part of it, predict the rest of a depth image that you didn't observe. Um, same depth to segmentation, or two of them, RGB and depth, and so on and so forth. In fact, all of these possible, uh, possible combinations are randomized, and they do come up during training. So the network is directly trained to be um, ready to face any of these combinations and to be modality um, invariant. OK. So what I'll show next, uh, before we look at the scaled up model, is the analysis of this idea at a smaller scale, trained only on ImageNet, with a model that has only a few hundred million parameters. And let's see if it works or not. So these are some of the results. Um, the first column shows the input and network. The middle is the reconstruction, and the right one is ground truth. So for example, if you look at the image on the right, there, is a, there has been a scene of skiing. The model did not receive any RGB information, a sparse set of depth and a sparse set of segmentation. And it reconstructed an idea about what the RG image would, RGB, RGB image would have looked like. That's what you see on the top. And you can see that, for example, put, um, it rendered the ground white. Why? Because in some of the sparse patches in um, segmentation, one of them says a snow. And therefore, it realizes that there must be a snow on the ground. It relates it back to the RGB and now paints the um, ground white. So it's a relation between not seeing the RGB, but relating the other modalities to what the RGB would have looked like as one possible case. Um, here's another analysis. Here you can see the input tokens traveling from one modality to another. So um, the middle column, again, is the reconstruction. And what you want to see is that the middle column remains fairly stable, despite the fact that the, the inputs are 
wildly basically changing from the input modalities. And that is the representation of the fact that the network is basically successful in making somewhat agnostic to the input modality what the output would be. And you can see cases, for example, that are meaningful, like the bus is yellow, but as soon as there's one patch of red, it paints the rest of the bus red. Why is, why is that the case, yellow or gray? Um, it's because if you don't have any RGB evidence, only see depth and segmentation, it's impossible to know what color a bus would be. So those modalities are basically ill posed towards color. It can give you shape and so on. You can see there's a bus, but there's one patch shows up and it turns it red. Um, that's because without any RGB evidence, you don't know what color something would be. You just know it's there. But um, why is it yellow? Because probably that's the expected value of buses, like yellow, gray, and so on. That's the, way, that's the best you can do without having direct evidence. So the model does actually squeeze out the statistics that it can from the data. So this is another analysis, what we call probing the model, uh, cross-model probing. So here the model receives an R a depth image and two RGB patches and no segmentation. But this time, we are freezing one of the RGB patches and the one that is marked with red, we are manually changing the color and we are seeing how the model actually reacts to that change. So what you're seeing is that it decides that the scene would look like some two, two fruits that follow the certain color pattern that the patch is determining. Now, only there are two RGB patches in the image, so it's impossible to know what's going on in the scene by only looking at those. So the way the model would have to have solved this problem is to look back at the depth image, have a sense of segmentation or a general like, semantic understanding of the scene to realize how far these colors should be propagated. And these are more challenging than simple reconstruction, or in my opinion, even you know, quantitative transfer learning results to images and so on, because first of all, they're out of distribution. There are no blue oranges or something like that in the data, so it's, under, it's more useful to understand to some extent for certain aspects that what the representation is the network that we have learned. Um, here are more examples of the same thing. You can play around with it. It's quite fun. You can, you can create a pink lizard and... Uh, and if you go to this website down there, you can find examples, pick your own, and kind of interact with it, move the slide bar, and so on. So the first idea was masking. The second idea that make, made us quite scalable was pseudo-labeling. So in order to not need data sets that come with all of these modalities, we use performant networks um, that can be an approximation of what the annotations would be. For example, surface normals and depth. This is from one of the previous projects that we have done, OmniData. Um, you can, again, visit that website, take a picture with your cell phone, and see how the results would be. So in fact, everything that I showed so far was pseudo-labeled. There is no annotation. Everything I'll show next, also on other data sets, on Coyo 700 million and conceptual captions 12 million, they also come with no modality other than RGB and captions. Everything else that you'll see are pseudo-labeled. All right. So. Since we did this base work um, a few months ago and published it, we have been working with our partners in industry at Apple to basically redesign the architecture and scale it up based on the interesting results that we had so far. So I'll gloss over the details. I'll just give you a high-level idea that what has happened. So the architecture is, like I said, is redesigned. And um, now we have tens of modalities. And many of these modalities have wildly different formats. Uh, previously, it was all pixelized um, modalities like depth and, and uh, RGB and so on. Now we have, for example, bounding boxes. The representation is just two corners of it. It's a four-dimensional modality. Like each box has a four-dimensional number. Or there's text, which is like an autoregressive domain and so on. So, or neural network features like clip. So we have redesigned the architecture to enable all of these modalities that have very different formats to go into one model. Um, and um, uh, everything is tokenized, um, so basically the base model, the transformer, is a big token-to-token -token mapping. It has no idea. I mean, it has an idea of what modality it is dealing with, but it never sees direct pixels. It sees like a tokenized version of it. And, um, and also we have some other ideas for scalability, for example, randomized token um, subsets. So the result is that now we can successfully train tens of modalities. The model size and data size have scaled up to billions and the training length of um, trillions of tokens. So let's look at some results of how this looks like. Um, so these are some out-of-the-box predictions, the RGB image in and surface normals and depth and segmentation and so on, so forth out. Um, these are not cherry-picked um, results. So 
And you can see that some of them are quite complex. For example, the 3D of the scene, there's like a lot of uh, bushes and so on. Um, here is a giraffe in a very, I mean, a somewhat unusual pose, but the model holds up pretty well. And um, yeah, it's a relatively urban uh, and busy scene. Um, so here's the same thing, but a bit more challenging because it's shown over a video where the input R RGB is um, transforming from an abstract shape of cube to, um, to a skull and goes back to a um, sphere. And this is uh, more challenging because most of it is probably out of distribution based on the training data from natural images, but the model, again, holds up pretty well. And by the way, these are all frame-by-frame -frame predictions. There's no smoothing, there's no trick going on, and we intentionally actually don't do any of it because the, the intention of like, what we are seeing here, what I'm showing in the, in the whole talk, is not to have the most beautiful pictures. There are a lot of standard tricks that you can apply on top of these results to have the most beautiful, high resolution, and so on, so forth looking pictures, but we want to really see how the vanilla model is working, what kind of representation it has learned. So everything that you see is the vanilla training objective. So there's no tricks, there's no smoothing, there's no beautification, and so on and so forth. And we do that whenever we, we are more in the realm of like generative model, we want to create beautiful pictures, and it does improve a lot, but that's not what I'm discussing here, and that's not what we are showing here. All right, so I mentioned that we want to have an any-to-any -any, like uh, model. How well is that working? So here's an example on the left, you're seeing the input. Um, these are single modalities inputs. And on the right, you're seeing the predictions out of those single modalities. So I believe it's a picture of a bowl of food and so on. There's a caption of it. There's a bounding box, segmentation, and so on and so forth. You can see that, they, of course, um, all of the modalities are predicted. They can look through each of these rows and see that they're quite consistent with each other and sometimes quite complex. There's like. I don't know, grains of rice, and those things like sprinkled over, and they're consistent, like pixel consistent, which is also important because it signals that the network has learned probably a good unified representation under the hood. Like if you look at the, I don't know, the uh, last column, uh, or one to the last, like the potatoes, um, look at the potatoes in RGB and the potatoes in the surface normals and depth of it, there's like very good pixel alignment between the 3D and RGB and so on. These are all predicted out of one model. So these are hopeful. So now what I'll show next is that a number of um, mechanisms, mechanisms that are enabled by a model that have these many number of modalities and is performant. For example, we can do uh, grounded generation. Let's say if you want to create an image, let's say a bowl with fish and a bowl with rice. That's what you're seeing on the right. But also, besides this text prompt, you want to make sure that the output conforms to some form of other a structure that you have in mind. Semantically, you want two balls to be positioned a certain way, or you want the 3D to be in a particular place. So what you can do is that, besides the text, you can condition the model on one of these other modalities that you have. You can extract it from a reference image or in another way. So now if you look at the output, not only it conforms to the text prompt, it's actually a, um, two balls with fish and rice and so on, but they follow exactly the other conditioning that the user provided as well. So the consequence of being able to interact with the model through multiple modalities, not just one. Um, the interaction between these modalities are not fixed. They, they, you can apply a coefficient based on an idea called classifier-free guidance. So you can determine the weight of it, which makes these interactions more expressive as well. So here example, for example, the prompt here has been an oil painting of a blue flower. And that's the text but also you have the additional um, 3D structure that is the depth image that is additional prompt, the adi uh, additional conditioning. But now the slider, as it goes from left to right, the strength of the, of the 3D is determined. As it goes from left to right, it becomes increasingly, uh, it enforces this 3D structure to be increasingly preserved. So as you see, there's always a blue flower, but as it goes to the right, the flower becomes increasingly similar to the 3D structure that you want. And as it goes back to the left, it becomes increasingly dissimilar. So it makes it, again, more expressive. So another thing that you can do, basically, you can imagine if you're an artist, if you're a user, you want to interact with this model, it makes it easier for you to whisper to the model what you want. Um, for example, think about you have a particular image in mind. There is a park with, uh, with a river and skyscrapers in the background, and there are benches and people in particular positions. Now, 
um, it's hard to express all of these details through text and make sure they exactly come out the right way. Like, how do you describe where the bench should be exactly? And the two benches should be parallel, and people should be blah, blah, blah. So the other modalities come to rescue. So we can start basically this way. On the left, you can see um, the user started by the prompt uh, a local park and specified the location of benches and people through bounding boxes. And you render the, you generate the results, and that's what you see. It gives you uh, a park with a tree and, and, and people, but there is no river. The model generates also the semantic segmentation on the, all, the, all the other modalities as well. So the user can literally paint brush a river in the shape and position that it wants in the semantic segmentation and re regenerate this time. And in the second box, you see that now there's a river over there. Now, the tree is off the, what the user had in mind. They, the user wanted like an autumn tree, autumn color. And they can adjust that by this time by text and in painting. And by sequentially using these different modalities, and every one of them can be used at any step, um, you gradually start from something that was off. And through just a few steps, you can get it to be very close to what the user had in mind. So essentially, these models are more expressive. You can interact with them in more effective ways. Um, another probing example. How long? Minus two. Oh, shit. OK. <laughs> wow, how did that happen? Uh, OK, I'll go fast. So this is another probing example. There are two bounding boxes here. One of them is frozen. It's a bed. And the other one is a bicycle. And the bicycle is the field one. And the bicycle goes around. So the bed is frozen and um, sets the context. And what you want to see is that how the model actually reconciles these two. So on the left, top left, there is a bed, and there's a bicycle in front of it. And it just puts a bicycle in front of the bed. But now, if the user puts the bicycle like in a weird aspect ratio up on the wall, like on the right, uh, it decides to print it as a painting on the wall, because that's you know, the way this most likely scenario to reconcile these two, and so on. So I'll skip this video, but this actually shows the same thing. That, um, that in a smooth way, again, no frame-by-frame -frame prediction. What you want to see is that there's a bicycle that is flying around and reconciles the context. And um, there's a lot of flashing, but that should be the case, because these are frame-by-frame, -frame and the input is under constraint. So um, therefore, this should be the case. I'll skip this. Again, it's before lunch. There are a lot of numbers, but I'll also give you a summary that um, in, these are transfer learning studies. So in the end, if you want a model that is likely to be across the board for a diverse set of tasks good, this make, uh, procedure that I described is a good way to go about it. But if you want a model that is specialized for a certain task and the user doesn't care about anything else, they probably can find alternatives that are better. But that's not what our intention. We want a foundation model. These are the modalities that we have added or we are adding. The new ones are very video-oriented, very hardware-oriented. For example, IMU, we, are, we have added, and we are adding large language model embeddings. Um, motion, a lot of neural network um, features. For example, ImageMind from um, Meta or Dino V2 and, so, uh, V2 and so on. All right, so to conclude, what I discussed was a first steps towards a scalable and versatile any 20 foundation model. So we are working on further scaling up across all modalities and all access, basically. Ultimately, we want a grounded model of the world. So large language models have impressed pretty much all of us, I suppose. But one criticism toward them is that their knowledge is ungrounded. They are detached from the physical meaning of what they say. And one way to make them more grounded is to bring sensory data into the picture. And that's what we are doing. And that's, well, ultimately, you, want, you would want a model that's active in the world. It can act and measure the reaction and develop, ultimately, a causal, actionable model of the world. But short of that, you can go far by observational data and um, using sensory data to describe. And along the same lines, it would be useful to have a physically plausible uh, for M2, like define a subset of these modalities that actually we can put a hardware platform, like a robot, that has audio, camera, um, IMU and so on, and more closely implement the story that we had in the beginning that maybe that's a way to actually have um, systems that learn more similarly to biological organisms. And uh, we are excited about co-training with large language models to get some of the benefits from that. For example, symbolic reasoning the language is good at, and we are working on it. And lastly, in context learning. So we are hoping that because these models are 
uh, multimodal, there would be an easier way to interact with them, and therefore there would be a good base model for doing in-context learning, basically fine-tuning free adaptation. And lastly, obviously the heroes are the students that actually did the work. So thanks to them and thanks to you. Thank you, Amir. Uh, again, for questions, raise your hand. Uh, there's one over there. Uh, thank you for the for the very interesting talk. Um, I really enjoyed Wolvit, and I was a question about integrating the IMU in the model, the thing you talked about at the end. Mm -hmm. um, you presented a lot of work with mask um, images. Can you use that with IMU directly because they much lower dimension, basically? The yeah, complex. in that sense, uh, it's not lower dimensional than let's say bounding boxes, right? Bounding boxes, there's like represented by two corners, four numbers. Everything is tokenized. You can drop tokens, and it seemed to be working. OK, that, yeah. thank you. <laughs> sure. uh, also, thank you for the amazing talk. Um, I'm fascinated by the method of using pseudo labels. And I was just wondering um, whether you observe um, performance increases compared to the expert models that you use um, to compute these pseudo labels after the multimodal training? Yeah, uh, that's a very good question. We frequently wonder that and we pay attention to finding those cases. Yes, occasionally you observe sparks of you know, one plus one is bigger than two. Um, you can justify why that can happen. For example, these different pseudo labels are trained on different data so they can bootstrap each other and so on. Ultimately, what I expect is that, uh, you know, if everything goes well, you can outperform all of them. You can bootstrap all of them or some of them more than others, but you're all going to be also bounded by that. So I view what we're doing now is more like a base training that can get you close to the finish line, but probably we aren't going to need like higher quality data as the very last step, just like what Angelo showed. And generally in like large language models, there are multiple steps of training. There's base training with just internet, and there's some supervised training, and then there's some uh, reinforcement, lear reinforcement learning human feedback. So I suspect we are going to need multiple stages too, but we are really trying to push it forward without entering the second and third phases. And it's, it has been working actually better than we expected. Thank you. Can we, maybe one last quick question. I do it very quickly. Yeah. Really nice with the def maps. Have you tried with 3D models? 3D models in the sense of the 3D model being the input? Because some of the modalities that I showed, they're already 3D, but very represented as images. Like they're basically 2.5D, like depth and um, surface normals and so on. So they are well informed about the 3D. But there are other ways that we can encode 3D. For example, we can directly again tokenize a mesh. And then that would be the input. That's one of the additional modalities that we are working on. Um, but yeah, I don't see any, any reason that we would be bounded to not do that. It has worked in a way for more like modalities that have different formats than more different formats than RGB. And so yeah.